The idea of time obviously is really important and designing time into the project is really important as well because it doesn't mean that the project is done at the day it opens. There's no necessarily beginning or end. Well, architecture is temporary. It should remain and it would always remain open-ended. That is something we always try to remind ourselves in the design process. I always think Seoul's work had that type of aura, this invisible envelope that projects out. And sometimes this envelope is not that invisible. You know, like in the Korean gallery, like in the temporary installations, it's always an aura. I'm very interested in this part of the aura in their work. Why we are working on temporary projects is that it allows us to very quickly respond to also you know, new ideas and things we're curious about. Architecture can be a very slow uh, profession, and sometimes you know the, the thoughts that you had at the beginning, you know, when the project is realized, you're already somewhere else with your thinking. And the nice thing of the temporary works is you know very quickly you can be sort of in dialogue with the, the contemporary um, world. After the financial crisis, the economy collapsed, the environment collapsed. And so for us, it was really interesting to think of the idea of modernity through this system of the structural grid, in a way, but one that is weak, one that can always collapse, and one in which the visitor or the audience or the user is actually responsible for its uh, stability. We got a gridded field of unstable rods connected to a, uh, a net above, as though somebody had decomposed a volleyball net from a beach in Queens. It was almost a renewal in our faith in the program. Everyone was flabbergasted. This was something that we hadn't seen yet in the 10-year history uh, of the competition. The American champion of pole dance called us and said they want to do a performance in the space. It was the perfect collaboration. The space was performative and the people occupying it was performative. That idea of a design process in which we are open to collaborations and partners and input from outside, that was, I think, one of the most formative you know, aspects of that project. Those themes in pole dance have found their way into designs for museums that are proposed and built around the world. So there's a very direct relationship between the experimental temporary installation and an emerging design practice establishing the themes of what they think are important in architecture. What Soil did, what Florian and Jean did, was to transform the space into, into almost like a pause to make us reflect and think about issues of shape and form, but also of security and insecurity, issues of permeability and access. We really love the idea of the storefront being open, so we thought, how can we keep the storefront open in the middle of the winter? We thought, what if we winterize the, the storefront? It was shrink wrap uh, for boats. Typically, when you shrink wrap an object that's inactive, it becomes this very static thing that's just sitting there. But then when you shrink wrap a building where people are in there and then there is a conversations happening and the lights are spinning out of it, then it's a completely different reading of that object. This idea of agitating the audience and sort of rubbing up to the public sphere, also here the, the public rubbed back because the next day the whole thing was uh, sprayed over by, uh, by graffiti. Vandalized would be a term that some people would use. Occupied uh, could be another word. Animated, uh, enacted. And what I think is very interesting about their work is that the forms and the, even the shapes that they actually produce are not always immediately legible they produce a moment of uncanniness. You don't know exactly what it is. And I think it is in that moment of non-recognition in which there is kind of latent potency of actually things becoming something else. It is in the making of otherness that I think we can identify and produce new spaces of action. So from a very specific space that is the one of aesthetics, I think uh, as architects they are able to produce spaces that also make us think and reflect about what the city can be and what architecture can be. 
Chengdu at that moment was the fastest growing urban site in China and our installation was an attempt to address some of the consequences of a very fast growing urbanizing environment. And Chengdu is known as the garden city. A famous garden city that's been paved by concrete. We invited the visitors to rent the bicycle and each bicycle would have seed bombs. This actually allowed many of the seed bombs to go into sites that's forbidden to general public. After they dropped these bombs, they could geotag them and write a little note and that would show up on a map. It was important that the garden was forming in the imagination through this digital mirroring of the action itself. We are always interested in dematerializing and understanding time as a material to work with in our architecture. Specifically with this project, it's more about sort of the way in which you organize people in the city and have them participate in an experience. So how to create a way um, to escape the city while being in the city. And then my elderly next door neighbor. We thought through storytelling, we could create this isolation and we could sort of you know, take you out of the loudness of the city into this other space. Compared to where I come from, New York felt like a mecca of tolerance. Every immigrant comes with also the memory of the space that they grew up in, the space that they passed through getting here, and that they also perceive space in different ways. Jackson Heights, one of the most diverse uh, neighborhoods in, uh, in New York. I forgot, 120... 173 languages. languages spoken. Yeah. All kinds of people are stopping for an espresso, a cafe con leche, a mango lassi. Stories of transition. So that's where also the title of Transistoria comes from. It's like this idea of going through a transitionary moment in one's life and finding a home. I sat on the curb long for what might have been three minutes. You would be listening to these very intimate stories um, on these wonderful installations designed by Soil. Sitting in these very random spaces in Jackson Heights. Somebody's apartment, a front yard for a church. And the experience of going through that as a visitor, I think must have been rather amazing. It was a very emotional project, and it was only there for two, I think, weekends or three weekends, and then it was gone. It was a really interesting and important platform for us to explore this concept of the space, not only in what you can see, but also the invisible space. How do we make a forgotten space in Manhattan to come into the public imagination with something that's very mundane and very ordinary. They asked us, can the tent curve? Uh, and initially we said, no, this is what it is. And they said, well, let's ask the contractor. So we asked the contractor and they said, well, we could do that. Yeah. So when you have a tent that curves, it means you don't see the whole length at once which makes it much less intimidating to visit. Looking straight forward, you don't see just the corridor. You see art. There are points where it curves and your eye line hits an artwork. So it's a great end of corridor kind of moment to see a picture. It is possible to create something extraordinary out of something that's incredibly ordinary. And that's the most enjoyable parts of architecture design for us must be one of the lowest cost per square meter of anything that they've done because it's 20,000 square meters at a very small budget and is only on for five days. So it's probably the shortest period and the largest thing. The space that's always used for transition, no one really pay attention to that space. But they did this big cathedral-like structure that makes people want to stay and ponder. And for them to do that installation and ingratiate it and slow people down as they walk through, make them aware, you know, of what was not there. And even for people that have been working there for decades, you know, just to stop and understand, I think that these are what architecture does best. We hoped that people passing over this ramp actually started to really become aware of their own body and moving through space, just contemplate that bodily movement. Well, the passage was uh, meant to be temporary. The fastening of the materials were quite easy, but the staging, you know, put up the scaffolding in mid-air was not easy. 
Uh, so as a result, dismantling of a project would be incredibly expensive. You know, it's almost like building a structure itself. So by default, it was uh, grandfathered in, in, into a permanent piece. <laughs> I think that's the brilliance of how they, they plan ahead, you know. In Bloom was a project that was so temporary that it never even um, happened. We were asked by Ben Kimmond, an artist, to work on an installation together, and he is very interested in bringing people together also through events and ceremonies and rites. It was an object, but at the same time it's also a situation. So the architecture was a facilitator for an event and a relationship to happen, but it also had a form to it that was very recognizable and it became the symbol of that event, which is also what architecture can do very well. It solidifies and gives importance to often things that are transient and forgotten and um, invisible, and it makes those things visible. What's interesting about the canopy as an obsession for us is that we feel and that in architecture we tend to ask very complex and complicated questions and not enough of the simple question. For example, what it means to be under something. The question of the primitive hut. What it means to create an environment that was human. And how do we re-examine that question of inhabiting not just nature in such a direct way but in a mediated way and make something that's easily deployable. And also it's about working with the light in this very transient way. And the creation of a canopy certainly also affects a lot of our other thinking. I think the space right above us, um, the relationship between us and say the heavens uh, and how to filter that layer is something that you, know, you see in projects like UC Davis or you know, our proposal for the Adelaide Contemporary or in some of these other uh, more permanent institutional spaces. We invited uh, uh, Soil to collaborate together with the artist Anna Privaci. Probably the most intimate space in a way. It's literally the space you know one needs to be um, just around you. So is it is it a piece of clothes? Is it a tent? Is it a shelter? What is it? It's like right on the edge of architecture. It's a performance piece, you know, so it has a really like temporary setting and it. it's both a sound performance as well as an environmental performance. You know, talk about the air filter, which these structures are made out of and how this breathing of these wind instruments, you know, kind of facilitate the, the symbolic idea of the exchange of air between the plants and the human inhabitants. We worked together with a composer, Veronica Krausas. Uh, she wrote a piece which is performed by instruments that need air in order to produce music. You know, you go there, you have a certain quietness of observation and studying the plants, and suddenly there will be these trombone and trumpet players, you know. And then maybe those who don't understand the environmental story behind it, but I think the performance became a window for the general public to understand a deeper message. We are part of a you know, continuous flow of architectural culture. By replicating and um, mirroring that one surface, that entire environment becomes this marble forest and this um, endless marbleized space that you walk into. Although it's only created by something that's very two-dimensional and very thin. You see people enter and you don't know where they Exit. It's a quite simple installation, but I think spatially really rich. It does sort of riff on this traditional idea of the colonnade. Once you get into the space, some people call it like a digital space, or like it's almost like an infinity. And I think that relationship between something that is maybe from the outside typologically very historical, uh, but as soon as you enter, you're sort of in a spatial dimension that maybe is, is a completely new type of experience. In order to consume, we're producing a lot of things, but actually living can be very minimal. We were interested in doing more with less, and this situation that we created, we were imagining it would be quite a dense living situation with very minimal material means to achieve that. 
to think about a new type of living, basically a mini living, so small footprint, more mobile, more flexible, and more in relation to the environment. So it's a concept home, but it asks basically, can a home also be part of creating a, a healthy environment? I think what's also nice about this project, and it ties into some of our other projects that deal with wrapping and skins, is it creates a completely new object. It's a new way of living, and it also looks like a new way of living. Into the Hedge is re-examining some of the modernist ideas with a fresh eye. What if we make our project about purchasing and replanting the hedge that needs to be replaced in the Miller House? In this moment in history, we had this opportunity to see these trees as individual elements and to come into contact with them, not as a border and a boundary, but as a place that you can walk into and engage with. The installation in some way works with the landscape and the interior uh, elements of, the, of that house and, and brings them into a new public um, experience. It was sort of the best of both worlds. It was a temporary project that was engaging to the community and then it also went to good use and purpose within the community afterwards. And so people could understand in a tangible way the way that things could transform over time. And the temporary can also have permanent influence. The whole project is really a progressive preservation effort. We want to build a community of people that cares about and understands the cultural heritage and legacy of Columbus. So when the time comes, people understand why we need to care for these things. And so understanding architecture not as the end of things, but it's just a momentary, a momentary coming together of ideas, of materials, and also pregnant with new possibilities um, as a different understanding of architecture. I think in the past people think about temporary structures as an intermediate step to the permanent building. And I think in, in many ways, um, a lot of architects, I would consider so ill one of them, that they see the temporary pieces as sometimes the final piece itself, you know, that really it's there for a short period of time, but it activated the life that it needed to. Sometimes we forget, you know, for who it is that we are actually building, experimenting, testing the ground. And I think it is important that, that we reflect and that we really start uh, somehow make, being a bit more aware um, about, about agency and about uh, uh, the politics of those aesthetics. In fact, I think this show is not, about, it's not only about temporary architecture, it's about how does one push the agenda and how does one take some risks and, um, and what can that afford us.